Good morning, everybody, and welcome to AI. My name is Robert Doerr, and I'm so pleased to have you all here this morning for this important discussion of education policy in the United States. Um, we are particularly gratified and happy to have the Secretary of Education, Betsy DeVos, with us, her husband, Dick, Counselor to the President, Kellyanne Conway. It's a great honor to have them all here for this important discussion of a topic that is particularly important to AEI and our education policy team, led by Rick Hess and Nat Malkus. And we're also pleased to have, you know, I like to say that AEI is a Washington-based think tank, but we're not a Washington-focused think tank. And so we have three distinguished leaders from around the country, from Tennessee, from Arizona, and Pennsylvania. And they will uh, talk about how some of the issues we're talking about here in Washington affect the children and parents and schools in those parts of the country. And really, that's what our discussion is all about. How can we make our schools better? Now, a little bit about, uh, just to give a sense of how I come to this issue and look at it, and why I think it's so important. Some of you may know that I spent 20 years in the social services departments of New York State and New York City, working on any poverty programs. And I was focused on the various issues with our ways in which we help people get into work and get out of poverty and move up economically. Personal responsibility, work, work supports, those things were important. But I always knew that there was another domain, another domain of activity that was equally important to our safety net programs, maybe more important than our safety net programs, in helping struggling families move up and helping their children move up economically. And that was the world of education. And no one has done more, it seems to me, in expanding options and choices and fighting for giving parents and children the ability to make choices about their future and escape what I, was, what I perceived in the city of New York and have perceived across the country failing public schools than the current Secretary of Education, Betsy DeVos. And so as I look at this and I think about this issue and I think about the, the, the proposal that the Secretary is going to talk about today, it seems to me it is about just that. How do we provide options for families and children so they can make the choices they need to improve their fortunes in the future. No issue is more important, it seems to me, in helping families move up economically. And at AI, that's a principal focus of our work, economic opportunity for all. So I'm particularly glad to have the secretary, her husband, Dick DeVos. They are great friends of AI. We welcome you back here. We're honored to have you. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Well, thank you all. Good morning. And uh, thank you to AEI for hosting this important forum today. Robert, thanks for your hospitality and for your principled conservative leadership, especially now in your new role. It's always a pleasure to be back here with so many friends. Our ideas are advanced by the work of this institute. There are many who have worked for the cause of education freedom and for our nation's students, especially Rick and Nat. So I'm looking forward to our conversation today. We're here to talk about education freedom scholarships. Let me just say a few things about our proposal to set the table before our discussion. Here's what it is. A $5 billion annual federal income tax credit for voluntary contributions to 501c3 nonprofit organizations that provide scholarships to students. The key element of the proposal is freedom. Freedom for everyone involved, students, families, teachers, schools, states, any and all can choose to participate, or they can elect not to participate. That's what freedom is all about. We know gaining this freedom will require more work in some states than others, and certainly in that body up the hill. But as more states offer more options to families, Demand will rise and pressure will mount on those who've not yet embraced the opportunity. Ultimately, freedom scholarships require only one thing. Students and parents must be empowered to make decisions and choices. It should come as no surprise to anyone in this room why we've stepped forward with a bold, transformative idea for students. American education isn't working for too many of them. We've known this for more than 35 years. The devastating landmark report, A Nation at Risk, 
detailed the dire state of American education and warned us all, and I quote, history is not kind to idlers. Well, if there's any word to describe too many parts of American education today, it's idle. You've seen our nation's report card. You know what I mean. Two and three of our nation's eighth graders aren't proficient in any core subject. Two thirds. We also know this. The United States ranks 24th in reading, 25th in science, and 40th in math in the world. You've heard me talk about these results before. And I don't take any pleasure in reminding anyone about them. Yet there are many who pay lip service to the sorry state of affairs in American education, but offer more and more of the same as a solution. More spending, more regulation, more government. They, sh they assure us that this time it will work. This time it will be different. Yet, as it's said in these halls, we are being mugged by reality daily. That's why now is the time to do something different, something better. Embrace the thing that makes America great, freedom. The freedom to learn, the freedom to grow, the freedom to rise, the freedom to pursue happiness. On this we can all agree, or at least we should be able to. So I remain dumbfounded that some conservatives who masquerade as education reformers have criticized this proposal. Who would have thought that Ted Cruz or I, of all people, would be accused of trying to grow the federal government? Think about that for a minute. You all know me. I've fought alongside many of you for more than 30 years to expand the freedom of families and diminish the role of government in our lives. I wouldn't support anything that violates my principles or ours. So here's what our Education Freedom Scholarships proposal doesn't do. It doesn't grow the government bureaucracy one tiny bit. It doesn't create a new government office of school choice. It doesn't impose any, any, it doesn't impose any new requirements on states or on families. It doesn't take a single dollar from public school students, and it doesn't spend a single dollar of government money. And it doesn't entangle schools with federal strings or stifling red tape. In fact, it can't, and that's by design. The truth is, our proposal is a highly efficient and effective way of funding education. It connects the dollars to the students, not the system, with no bureaucratic sponge in between. The Education Freedom Scholarships are the conservative answer to what ails education in America. They also happen to be the answer that a supermajority of parents, particularly African American and Hispanic parents, are looking for. They are the reason education freedom is on the march from Florida to Pennsylvania, from Illinois to Arizona, and many places in between. I've just come back from a tour across the Midwest to highlight opportunities education freedom will provide. At every stop, I heard from students, families, teachers, and local lawmakers about how education freedom is changing lives. But I also heard the loud voices of bullies who are threatened by that freedom. Now, it's their right to demonstrate and to protest and to say sick things. What worries me, though, is the message they're sending to parents and students. Big union bullying is flat out unjust. It's unfair to the many students and parents who simply want better for themselves or their sons or their daughters. I've been blessed to get to know many, many families who have exercised education freedom. Many have low incomes. Many are black or Hispanic. Many are burning the candle at both ends to make ends meet and help their children have a better life. They aren't anti-public school or for privatization. They couldn't care less about how a school is legally structured or how the funds flow. They care about their kids. 
They care about them getting a great education. They care about them being safe. They care about how schools can help them prepare their children for successful careers and meaningful lives. On the other hand, union bosses don't put kids first. They don't put kids, kids' futures first. They put themselves first. Look no further than West Virginia. Many of us remember the first strike, which kept students from learning for two weeks. The second strike is far more telling. There was already in place a deal for yet another pay raise. So why did union bosses force another strike? because the bill would have also allowed for up to seven charter schools and would have created ESAs for a very small number of families, maybe enough to satisfy or to serve less than one-third of 1%, 1 about 1,000 of West Virginia's 300,000 students. This is clearly anti-parent and anti-student. Education freedom is pro-parent and pro-student. It's not anti-public school. If your school is working for your child, you can stay put. One parent's freedom to make a choice doesn't mean you have to make a choice, doesn't it mean everyone else has to make the same choice. Education freedom isn't about elevating one type of school over another. It's about trusting parents and believing in students. My mission is to unleash a new era of innovation in education to drive unprecedented achievement. It will happen in public and private schools alike, and we should embrace that. Our obligation isn't to any type of school. It's to students. America's students can lead the world because America must continue to lead the world. It's time we put them first, and that's exactly what Education Freedom Scholarships will do. Thank you, and I am looking forward to our conversation. Thank you, Madam Secretary. That was terrific. Uh, I'm Ray Kess, Director of Education Policy Studies here at AEI. Uh, we now have about 35 minutes uh, for conversation uh, with the Secretary, and also we have the pleasure of being joined by Kelly Conway, Senior Counselor to the President of the United States. Thank you for joining us, Counselor. All right. Uh, Madam Secretary, you talked a bit about the Education Freedom Scholarships, but I wonder if first we could go um, a bit more into the nitty gritty. So. You mentioned that these complement existing programs in the states. What are those programs in the states? How does this complement those? How does this all work? Well, thanks again, Rick, for the opportunity to be here. And Kellyanne, it's so great to see you and be here with you. Um, so states can decide whether or not they'd want to participate in this program. And there are many states today that actually have some kind of choice program. Most of them have charter, public charter schools, um, and many of them have private school choice programs. What this proposal would do is be a booster to all of those programs. It could augment and, uh, and, and expand existing programs or we've also encouraged people to think more broadly about what new creative ways they could use the funds that would come from the tax credit program to help satisfy the need in their state. And uh, I, I think about uh, rural states in particular. Many times people will say, well, there's no, you know, there's no way we're going to have another building next to a rural uh, high school. But I, I say, well, think differently about what choice can mean. What about students in that school, uh, one of whom might want to study something that that school can't possibly offer? That school, that, or that child, that student could elect to take that course virtually from the finest teacher somewhere in the world. Or perhaps there's a handful of students in that school who learn differently but don't have the opportunity to go somewhere else physically to school. There's no reason they couldn't opt to have a micro school within their school that approached their education, their learning differently and allowed them the, the right fit for them there. So 
there's no end to the ways to be creative to really implement choices for families. And this is meant to really help jumpstart states that haven't taken that leap uh, to encourage them to do that, not mandate it, and to augment states that already have taken that leap and, and want to continue to provide opportunities for students. So, Counselor, I mean, it sounds like we're talking about more than private school choice programs and more than charter schools. I hear the Secretary talking about a variety of options. So how does this work? Uh, a state, say a state already has some of these programs, who decides that they're there? How do they work? How does this money support those programs? How does, if Congress enacts this law, how does that change any of this in states? Let me echo the gratitude for having us today and for elevating such an important issue into the consciousness of the audience here and anyone who's watching now or in the future. The secretary gave a very powerful uh, set of opening remarks that I think touched upon many different aspects here. And I'd like to... Um, amplify some of those after I answer this particular question. So in about 18 states, we, they have programs, and they've obviously opted in. These states are not red or blue politically. They're pretty diverse. I mean, they're everything from Florida and Arizona to Illinois, as we said. And in those states, you have, in, in, the way this would work federally is you have a scholarship granting organization, and it involves, usually involves educators, education specialists, uh, perhaps others could weigh in, but they have to approve of the formula. They have to approve of who or what, whom or what would receive the actual monies and what they would do with that. But one thing that comes with the freedom the secretary has so eloquent, eloquently spoken to this morning is flexibility. And one of the main points of appeal to me as a public policy practitioner as somebody who works um, on behalf of the country, took an oath to the Constitution, and as a parent, is the flexibility to use those monies, certainly for the classroom and for traditional curriculum and instruction, but also for tutoring, for summer programs, for virtual learning, for needs that the educators may have identified in that area. And that is really why, even though it's a, it's a, it's, it's a, it's on your federal tax form, the deduction you would take, the credit you would take, it doesn't reduce your tax liability, but it increases the optionality for these students in these states. And with that freedom comes the flexibility, and I think that's incredibly important. So this does not disturb the state programs. If anything, the state programs are best practices that show, hey, this is already working in places on a state-by-state -state level, and they've been wildly successful. It is truly that if you build it, they will come. And who has come? Many outfits, many organizations have come because they figure if they are paying you know, taxes anyway and get a tax credit that actually helps, they can more readily direct the money toward scholarship granting opportunities in their own states. And this is something that's been a priority for this president, uh, certainly the Education Freedom Scholarships, but just the overall flexibility and the freedom agenda for education. I have to say, the very first time I met Cory Booker, before he held public office was in the education space. I met him at a school choice event in New Jersey, or maybe it was Manhattan, I believe it was near Newark, New Jersey. Uh, and he was groomsman in a mutual friend of ours um, in the school choice movement. Um, he was able to cross the wedding aisle, but not the political aisle now, unfortunately. And and that's that really is unfortunate, because as the secretary pointed out, she, she described it as being dumbfounded. It is really disheartening, if not maddening, to see a lack of bipartisan consensus on what is quintessentially a nonpartisan issue. We should really put the kids first and echo what we've done legislatively on measures like criminal justice reform and I think more um, propitiously uh, the drug crisis. Every single Democrat who voted for H.R. 6, the most comprehensive piece of legislation on any single drug cri crisis in our nation's history a year ago, every single Democrat voted in favor of it. So we can do this when it's as something as fundamental and nonpartisan in nature as giving people uh, access to more treatment and more prevention education when it comes to drug, making sure people who have paid their debt to society are no longer languishing in prison, and in this case, giving these children, these, these students, uh, more flexibility and freedom to learn and to prosper and to be economically independent. Let's stay with that for a second. Um, Counselor, you, you just mentioned the First Step Act where there was broad bipartisan support. Obviously, we have not seen that thus far with regard to the Education Freedom Scholarships. 
What's the difference here? Why is it playing out so differently in the one in, in education than it did in criminal justice reform? I know we'll both speak to that, and the secretary certainly touched upon um, the influence of the unions. And she was remarking that the union bosses don't put the students first. That is true, and I would challenge and defy each of them to prove otherwise. Uh, what are they so afraid of? It doesn't take money away from the public schools. It just amplifies the number of, of, and actually it helps the public schools in that, as the secretary said, maybe that school already offers courses and resources that another institutional learning does not. So perhaps they'll benefit as well from this. But I notice a lot, many of the folks who are against, um, who don't put the students first, also don't put their own children in the public schools. And that is a cruel irony, um, well, let's just call it hypocrisy. Um, <laughs> it's past 9 a.m. and it's Tuesday and uh, Congress is in recess. It's I ironic, but it's hypocritical as well. And so uh, back to my point where you, you have Elizabeth Warren, of all people, formally talking about the benefit of fully funded vouchers and all the freedom and flexibility that would wrought, that could bring, that could deliver. The aforementioned Cory Booker, many, many Democrats over the years. I remember working with Senator Joe Lieberman and Representative and also Pastor Floyd Flake on education reform in a bipartisan fashion in the Congress 20 years ago. And you know the only thing that has changed? The only thing that has changed is we have more students in need. I would challenge any of them to say this isn't pure, naked, raw politics. And that really is um, too unfortunate because we have an entire generation suffering from the lack of bipartisan support. But hope springs eternal. And maybe they will see that what's happened in their own states, these 18 states, and growing, and what could happen if we just uh, put it to the test at the federal level. And I would just echo what Kellyanne said. Um, every single president and secretary of education since charter schools became a thing have supported charter schools and their expansion. And um, so it is inconceivable to me that we would now be in a place where um, Democrats just resist and, and uh, deny the benefit to students that um, freedom can provide and that opportunity for each to find their right fit would mean ultimately for our nation. So let's talk a bit about the scope of the proposal. Um, there's the figure $5 billion attached to it. How does that work? Is, that fi is the anticipation that there will be $5 billion a year in contributions? How would this be allocated across states? So the, uh, yes, $5 billion annual fund that individuals or corporations would choose to voluntarily contribute a portion of their federal tax bill to one of these 501c3 organizations. So participating states would name the 501c3s that could receive them, and then uh, if all 50 states participated, um, each state would get a portion of those funds as uh, designated by the Title IIA formulation. So a combination of uh, consideration of poverty and population. And, um, and for those, if states chose not to participate, those funds would go then to the, the ones that did choose to participate. And uh, I, I, there, I, I think there would be a lot of... Um, it, a lot of pressure from internally from folks in the states that chose not to to actually join in and provide those opportunities. And for states that already have programs, uh, their C 501c3s would be grandfathered in so they could automatically participate and expand their programs and choose to do something different in addition if they wanted to. And how big an increase would the five billion potentially represent to what states are currently seeing in their 501c3 programs? And uh, compared to, say, a state tuition tax credit program or existing state scholarship programs. Is this a big increase compared to what's already out there? Well, for all of the participating states, it would be a significant boost to what they're doing today. And, um, you know, the, the suggestion being that states ultimately want to and need to take, uh, take this opportunity seriously and expand within their own state. But I think about uh, the prospects for Florida, which is the state that I often cite as the one that's most advanced in their providing uh, freedom and opportunities for students. This would be a, a significant boost to, and in fact, I, I've heard from Governor DeSantis regularly on how important this would be to their efforts there.
So if we combine, say, existing Florida programs, how much do we know roughly how much that involves a year in terms of total dollars? I'm trying to recall, and I'm uh, the, the mental math is not coming back uh, I know that as feeling. quickly as as it should. But um, this would this would represent, in concert with what they're already doing, a very significant boost, and would really help to satisfy the demand that they have that's built up around tens of thousands of students. So well, let's talk about Florida for a moment, if we can. Obviously, um, former Governor Jeb Bush was a huge proponent of alternatives to the conventional um, public school system and was very popular for having accomplished that with the state legislature. Uh, in Florida, what's going on right now is they've basically um, saved money as they have in Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania saved about a, a half a billion dollars. It's not about saving money. It's repurposing the money to fit the needs of the students. We're not wearing green eye shades here and talking about education, but it does talk about how more efficiently and more targeted you can be with those resources. In Florida, I read the statistics, about 40% of African Americans are the recipients, about 24 or 25% Hispanic. And so you're talking about many different communities benefiting in the states where these um, scholarships, the funds are already available. And uh, you, you also see people talking to other people in states, you know, relatives and friends saying, well, why don't we have that here? You see a real grassroots pressure among the parents and other stakeholders in saying, in saying this works somewhere else, why don't we have it here? And that is, uh, to the Secretary's point, what, will, what ultimately will need to happen is people, as they have with school choice, as they have with charters, sort of going up the steps to state capitals and impressing upon their leaders within their states to help with the state programs. At the federal level, we are happy to be big federalists who recognize this does not expand the federal role. It is just, R-O-L-E, it is just, and I, and I have to push back even from the right when we get criticism about you're just expanding the federal role in, in education. No, this actually allows the states and the local um, public, the local school systems and the parents indeed to have more power and more flexibility just by recognizing a tax credit on your federal tax form. So let's stay with the mechanics of that a bit because I think it can help us think about these concerns about the federal role. How does this actually work? So I think, is this something that uh, would exist in the U.S. Department of Education or how would this actually operate? It would just simply be a portal at Treasury. So every state that chose to participate would submit uh, the list of one or more 501c3 organizations to be the scholarship granting organization and recipient of those federal tax funds. And uh, it, it would simply maintain the list. It would not create any new bureaucracy to administer it. The states really ultimately will administer, you know, through, indirectly the, through the 501c3 entities. But it really is a vehicle. And as I said uh, in my remarks, it, it is a very efficient and effective way to get uh, education funding directly to the students that need it most and really bypass a lot of bureaucratic sponge in between. And I, I, I think it's, uh, it, it's so simple that it confounds people sometimes. <laughs> That's Washington for you. Yes. <laughs> What about a, 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 a skeptic who says, well, that, sound, that sounds pretty good, but what about fraudulent 501c3s? What if states are getting taken to the cleaners by somebody who's playing games? How does that work? So the, the, the legislation requires that there be aud you know, auditing of the organizations, and of course 501c3s, um, first of all, have to be approved by the IRS to exist in the first place. And, um, and there's a requirement that 90% of the funds be distributed, so no more than 10% be used in administration. But other than that, it's a, it's a pretty simple approach. And you know, many states that actually have tax credit scholarship programs today have really good models for this. It's not like you'd have to reinvent the wheel. Um, other states could look to those models and either emulate them or do something slightly different. But there's, there's so many good models already in existence. Uh, this is simply a way for them to really grow them in a, in a very meaningful way. 
Now, you've both alluded to concerns from the right about this getting Washington, um, being Washington overreach, getting Washington too involved in education. Could you talk a bit more about that? Given what you've just described, what's the nature of those concerns and where do you think they're getting it wrong? Well, those critics from the right are absolutely correct that the federal government is already way too involved in education. Nobody's going to disagree with that, including the Secretary of Education and the President and the Vice President of the United States. So that's a given. But there's a, so there's always a suspicion that once you, the government is way too intrusive, invasive, expensive, and expansive in the case of education and many other areas of our life, that this would just open, continue to open those floodgates. The the criticism is ill-founded, respectfully, because this does not expand the federal role. It gives freedom and flexibility, and I believe if you just look past, if people are just, they're stopping, it's way too linear and constricted to say, well, it's your federal tax form, it's federal tax dollars, it's, it's, there are no strings to that. This is why you have these SGOs in the states to decide whom should receive the monies and then how they should be distributed or, or let them decide how to use them. Um, that is flexibility and freedom at its core. And but, but those concerns, I respect them. I disagree with them. But they also are relatively muted um, to a, a couple of, restricted to just a couple of limited couple of places. This has tremendous support among many um, conservatives and rank and file Republicans, I would say, and also libertarians um, who look at the freedom agenda in our education system. Yeah, and I would just add to that, um, every major religious organization that it deals with education is supporting this proposal. And as, as have many of the uh, state-based allies, uh, all of the state-based allies that have dealt with this issue on a state-by-state -state basis, um, they see the benefit of really having a vehicle for individuals to get funds directly to scholarship granting organizations that will ultimately benefit students directly. Well, and the polling is there. I want to interject that yeah. too. I mean, people who say, look at the polling. This is popular. This is not popular. The polling is irrefutable in terms of many, most Americans, majorities of Americans, including key demographic groups who would directly benefit from this. They, the appetite is there. The public opinion is there. Um, the public the public's intent or mood, willingness to try something of this nature, um, along with school choice and charters and other alternatives. So for those who watch the polls and pretend that as poll numbers increase somewhere they must follow, they're just not doing that here. Here, politics is getting in the way of public appetite. So this is a wonky room. Take, take a minute. You're a pollster. Okay. Give, us, give us a couple of the particulars out of the polling data that speak to you. Sure, I have them there in that bag. I can grab them, um, but I, I'm so afraid to touch a woman's handbag. I know there's <laughs> nothing in there. Uh, <laughs> uh, and I could, I could grab them for you, but we've all seen the polling data. You have vast majorities of Hispanics, African Americans, um, public school mothers uh, saying that they support when it is described in objective terms what this would provide. And also, just when it's described to them, 18 other states have had it. This is what has happened to those states. And more and more, I mean, I worked for many years. I had a client named Eva Moskowitz and her, um, her success charter network up in New York. At the beginning and when she started those, she had just come back from a, a Betsy DeVos type of conference out in Jackson Hole, I think, where they were all there and started her. And they're just enormous. And why, why is it enormous success? because she built it and the appetite just grew and the buzz grew. And then you had these labyrinth-like lines around blocks. I, I stood in them, I watched them, I talked to the, the parents and grandparents in them just to get a spot in the lottery. It's random, but they were just hoping that chance would go their way. And, and so they've had to increase. The other statistics I would tell you, because I thought this was a very clever poll that someone did, they basically asked me people, what would you do to improve education for your kids. And over 60% say they would forego going out to eat for a year. They'd forego specialty coffee and caffeine for a year. God forbid. They would forego. Yeah, I know. Well, I'm speaking to um, a pretty privileged audience in Wonky, Washington, D.C. on Massachusetts Avenue. God bless us. But, 
But they would, I mean, they are, they are saying, I would make the sacrifice if the benefit for my child were increased. Here we're saying, you don't have to make more of a sacrifice. The money will come to you just by allowing this mechanism to be in place. Mm. Uh, Secretary, I'm curious. Uh, you, you've had the opportunity to speak to a lot of folks in the states and communities about this proposal. Curious what struck you most. Where, what, 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 what doubts have you heard? Um, also, I'm curious, where have you found the warmest reception and what has really stuck in your mind about it? Well, there's a, a really warm reception wherever I've talked about it. And we've uh, c continued to convene um, leaders in states that many of whom are involved in, uh, in this world already, but others who are sort of on the fringe and are skeptical. And the more we talk about the possibilities and the more we um, can help paint the picture for how, it can they, how, how they could tailor some of their funds to their state to really meet needs in their particular state, I, I have to say the enthusiasm continues to grow. And, and I think that's really part of the, the key is to really help people think more broadly about what this could mean for individual students and in state-specific uh, environments. And I, I recently was in Alaska and had the opportunity to go to one of the mo re most remote villages there. Um, and as I was there thinking about the challenges and the opportunities for students there, we talked about the fact that what they have to deal with and, what they, um, and, and what's relevant to those students is very, very different than students as geographically um, dispersed as Miami. You can't get much further away geographically in our country than between those two points. And to think that um, we would try to impose from Washington or anywhere else a solution that is going to answer the needs for those students in Kivalina, Alaska versus Miami, Florida, um, suggests that we just haven't learned our lesson over the last 50 years. Mm. You know, you, you both have alluded to this. I'm curious. I mean, we've certainly heard lots of proposals from our progressive friends that we need to spend more on schools. I could understand them saying this is only $5 billion. We also need to triple Title I or what have you. But I'm curious why there's such dead set opposition to something which sounds like it is the opportunity to put more money into schools serving kids who need it. Well, I would, I would say it comes down to a matter of control. And those who have interest, self-interest, want to control the resources. They want to control everything around the resources. And they don't want uh, to let parents have the kind, and students have the kind of freedom that we're talking about, because that means they lose control. But I, I look again at Florida and how that environment in the last 20 years has changed for students across the state. And those who are in a traditional school have uh, realized and noticed the fact that as students make choices that are right for them, uh, those students that remain in those traditional schools continue to do better. And I would just uh, reference the fact that in 40 years since the Department of Education was founded, we have spent over $1 trillion at the federal level alone trying to close the achievement gap. That achievement gap has not narrowed one bit. And so to suggest that doing more of the same thing is going to yield a different result is Einstein's definition of insanity. We shouldn't do it. We should try something different. Mm. We're spending about $706 billion a year, I believe, um, in federal dollars, K through 12, to begin with. One of the more... One of the points of consternation for me is how many of the Democrats who are dead set against, sadly, this type of proposal, the Education Freedom Scholarship, school choice charters, and weren't previously, is that they've shifted all the way to free college and forgiving college debt. Well, what are we doing about every single student who needs a quality education now, who should not be constricted by their zip code or their parents' socioeconomic status? That's horrible, and that's what's happening, and I, I think it's almost obfuscation in a different way, or maybe they're cleansing their guilt of not of standing in the way of providing other 
freedom and freedom and, and, and incredible opportunities for education younger, that we should all just have free college. Uh, and that's just that's not fair on so many levels, but mainly because every student deserves an education through the 12th grade, a public education, it is their right. And whether they choose to go to college after that or can go to college or want to go to college, that's different. That's not. That's less than half of the country, and it's much less than half of the state in some places. What about the What about the fact that these funds that we're talking about, Rick and Se Madam Secretary, would go to technical and vocational, perhaps would go to um, alternative college? And we, I work in an administration where we have emphasized that. In fact, when I was Governor Pence's pollster, when he was running for governor and as governor, the number one most popular issue that he was governing on was, quote, expanding technical and vocational educational opportunities. It was through the roof. Because not everybody is college material. That's great. So go graduate high school. You walk this way and you're going to law school or college and then law school, I walk that way and I'm going to be a hairdresser the next day or, or, or a technician or a mechanic or work in the factory, which now requires computer skills or be a welder. Go make 40 bucks an hour the day after you graduate for high school. Sounds pretty good. And we just are not respecting the diversity of choices people make throughout their education post 12th grade. And I think we've got, we're in a movement here and we're having conversations here and now about helping them at the kindergarten level to thrive and to have uh, a better education that's more responsive to them individually and more responsive to the 21st century. Madam Secretary, one of the things that you have both have touched upon is that union uh, leadership has been pretty critical of this proposal. You've also noted on many prior occasions that you've said, look, educational freedom is good for teachers. School choice should be good for teachers. Square that for me. How is this, for teachers who are out there working every day to make a difference for kids, why do you think they should be supportive of this proposal? Well, first of all, it will afford them many more opportunities to find their niche and their fit as a teacher. I have talked with hundreds of teachers across the country, and I ask them regularly, what kinds of things do they need to feel valued and um, supported and what is the environment like for them? And almost to a person, I hear that while compensation is important, what we really need and what we really want is to feel valued, to have autonomy, to make decisions in our classrooms on behalf of our students because we're the ones closest to them. And I, I think that... Um, in the attempt to try to make things better from a top-down approach, uh, much of their flexibility and autonomy has been taken away over the years. And, um, and, and good teachers need to be unleashed to really be great at what they do. And commensurately, teachers who shouldn't be in the classroom, who simply are a mismatch for, um, you know, for what they're doing, probably should find a different vocation. And so this, I, I think this proposal will help teachers in a, in a very fundamental way in that there will be alternative um, paths and alternative learning environments that may be a much better fit for them and will allow them to be compensated and recognized accordingly. For any of this to matter, obviously, this has to become law. And right now, as you both have noted several times today, D.C. is a relatively polarized place. The parties uh, have uh, very different stances on this proposal. Uh, the White House and the House representatives are in a conflict, shall we say. Um, what's, what's the path forward for this to become law, for this to, for this to happen? Well, you may want to ask them. I think the country is watching how they spend their time and your money. And we all choose that in our personal lives, how we spend our time, how we spend our money. They work for us. They don't seem to be here very often. And when they are, they're focused on other things and other people, places, and things, I would say. And that's unfortunate. But they work for you. So the question really for the country is, how do you want them to spend your time? Do you think this is a worthwhile 
piece of legislation to put forth and just work through the committees. And I would say to them, what are you afraid of? If you want to vote against it, vote against it. But give others an opportunity to even get there. I think they're afraid of taking a negative vote that basically puts them at odds with millions of school children who can potentially benefit from this. And uh, so they don't, the way they spend their time and the current issues accepted has been pretty remarkable to me as somebody who was in the infrastructure meeting with the Democratic leadership and the committee heads, as somebody who works on health care every day, will be with the president in Florida on, on Thursday when he talks about Medicare, another health care building block. Uh, what are we afraid of in the process of actually pushing this forward in a bipartisan way, the way First Step Act was, the way the opioid and drug crisis were? You may just help that many more school children, either in your state or elsewhere. And this is the one where they truly have, I believe, partisan blinders on when it comes to educational freedom. And I would say there's no excuse. I'm not making a partisan comment. I said it's disheartening and somewhat maddening, particularly given how, given how hypocritical critical many of them are, otherwise talking about helping communities of color, otherwise help, saying I'm for the children, I'm for the children, I'm for the children. This is the fundamental right of every child to have a quality education that gives them a passport to the future and the dignity that goes with that. The last thing I would just say in this vein is the president wrote a book in 2000 where he talked about education freedom and he didn't, he didn't call it education freedom scholarships, but he was talking about alternatives. He was talking about that we're failing kids in our educational system. And in his first State of the Union, he said, if we could put a man on the moon and dig out the Panama Canal and win two world wars, we ought to be able to figure out a way to provide quality education to each student. So we're ready at the White House. I, I, we can get him to sign that today. But we need real bipartisanship, and we need priorities to put the kids first. Madam Secretary, what, uh, you know, what's the strategy to kind of push on that? Oh, your allies in the states, your colleagues, what would you encourage them to do? How do you try to get this ball rolling? Well, it is, uh, it is a matter of personal diplomacy in, in many cases. Um, you really do need to help paint the picture of what can be because uh, the issue has become very polarized due to the opposition on the other side. But I, I, uh, in, in the meetings that I've had in states, um, there is a, a real will to work with their particular delegation members and, um, and, and really urge the passage of this legislation. Um, Kellyanne's absolutely right. They need the, the folks up on Capitol Hill need to um, ask the hard questions about how and why they can and should oppose something like this opportunity. Um, all you need to do is spend time with one or more students that have had the opportunity to have their life trajectory changed, and um, it's very hard to make the argument not to support it. Um, and I urge and encourage all of them to do so. I know there's a great resistance to that, um, but it is, uh, it is the right thing. And I, uh, I, I, for those who have the opportunity, every member of Congress has had the opportunity for their children or grandchildren to go to the schools that they deem right for them. They should extend that same opportunity to every, every child and every family in this nation. Mm. All right, with that, let's go ahead and open it up for a few questions. Uh, we've got a couple of uh, our colleagues coming around with microphones. I would ask, uh, when you get the mic, identify yourself by name and affiliation, and then ask a question. Uh, if we get about 10 or 15 seconds in and I don't see a question coming, we'll give somebody else a shot. RJ. Thank you. Should I, should I stand? Or? Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, Leon Peace, thank you, Secretary DeVos. Um, my question is, uh, given the need for and the support for a lifelong education, um, would this uh, scholarships, would they be available for post-secondary, higher education, and for a graduate school, especially given the need for workers to be retrained as senior citizens in some cases to, to enter new, new opportunities? Well, it's a great question. Um, this proposal is really focused on K-12 education 
and for the states that actually wrap in uh, pre-K to their K-12 program, they could, they could uh, target that around preschool as well. But it really is focused on the, the K-12 years. But your point is a good one, um, and we should really be looking at education as a lifelong pursuit. Uh, there are some states that have implemented education savings accounts, which of course can be used to, tar to customize your education. And if you don't use up all of the dollars in a year, you can roll it forward. And uh, Arizona, for example, has a, an ESA that if you still have a balance at the conclusion of your K-12 years, you can use it for higher education. May, states that participated in this may look at doing something similar. Brenda. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm a student from Teachers College, Columbia University. Uh, actually, I have two very short questions. So A is that there is a, a, we, we find that there is a gap um, between the academic skills that you gained in school and the skills that are required at work. So the knowledge gap, like how would you close the knowledge gap? Secondly, because I'm a personally a Chinese student studying in the States, um, Many say that the trade war has affected the, the visa. Um, like, I just wonder what's the standing point of the Department of Education for during you know, you, even the trade conflicts? Like, what, what's your standing point in this issue? Thank you so much. Your first question um, about uh, closing the knowledge gap. Um, it, many of the schools that I've had opportunity to visit are approaching their education and learning differently for students and acknowledging that some of these gaps exist. And so they are, are really taking a different approach. And the more freedom we interject into education across the country, I believe the more responses and different approaches we'll have to, first of all, acknowledging that and then addressing it <laughs> and uh, allowing students to find that right fit but um, we, we do have a, a, a real challenge today um, because I think we've, we've uh, become too focused on one approach at the expense of really preparing students in a rapidly changing world for what comes next. Brennan. Thank you. Uh, my name is Yi Han. I'm a first year at American University, and I'm an intern at the Center for Education Reform. And there's a lot of talk about funding, but as a student, we don't see a lot of the immediate problems solved before us, and like the, the problem of graduate unemployment or mental health in schools or stuff like that. But what do you think is the largest problem in K-12 schools or even university that can't be solved with more funding? Well, I think, uh Per this proposal, we don't have enough freedom in K-12 education today, freedom for the families and students that aren't able to make the choices that, uh, that many who are wealthy and connected are able to make. And so it's a matter of really being fair to all students, not only fair, but allowing all students the vehicle and opportunity to find their right fit. Um, we have, as a, we are as a country, spending more than almost every country in the world on K-12 education, and yet we still rank 24th, 25th, and 40th in uh, the measures around reading, uh, science, and math. And so doing the same thing and putting more money behind it and expecting a different result, um, I, I don't think, that, I, I know that's not going to solve the, the issue or the problem. RJ? Yeah, hi. Ed, Edward Hudgens from the uh, Heartland Institute. Uh, as you know, the Department of Education, sorry, Department of Labor has recently is going to issue new uh, uh, rulings on apprenticeships, allowing private nonprofits as well as businesses to set up uh, the requirements for apprenticeships to deal with the incredible disconnect between education and the needs of the free market, jobs, careers, especially with exponential technology. And as you know, groups like CareerWise Colorado are trying to uh, connect kids in high school with businesses to do the learn and earn. Would the Freedom Scholarships uh, help facilitate this move to apprenticeships to allow the two-thirds of Americans who don't go on to college to actually get good uh, careers and jobs? Yes. 
Yes, Good. they could. <laughs> okay, that they was could easy. Could indeed be yes, they could indeed be used to facilitate apprenticeships, and in fact, I think it's a that that is a really important opportunity for states to look at. And I'll just quickly say on apprenticeships and skilling and reskilling and and all of that workforce development, the six million plus or seven million plus available jobs, more than people looking for them. There's no question that we're doing a whole of government approach. Obviously, Department of Education, Department of Labor on, on top of it. Um, early on in this administration, we invited to the White House a number of governors and cabinet secretaries, et cetera. But um, John Hinkenlooper, then the governor of Colorado, Democrat, uh, who somehow has been forced out of the race because he's a two-term successful governor of a swing state. But anyway, who emphasized, that's okay, um, ironic. But that I think the one that you mentioned in Colorado is one of many examples that are popping up across these states because the market is necessitating that. And I did want to make sure that we amplified today the value we see in after the K to 12 or during the 9 to 12, those acquiring a skill set and not just pushing everybody in, into college um, who, you know, who has other employment opportunities. But this is something that we've been doing in a bipartisan basis with the states, even if we can't get it done here. Although I, I think that Ivanka Trump has led the way here too with the um, Perkins grants and some other measures. Um, but as you can see, what the secretary is laying out today through the Education Freedom Scholarships is just the latest and one of the greatest uh, point, pieces of the overall education freedom agenda. We've been working on that for quite a while, and I think it's one of the bright line distinctions between us and the other side. Okay. Uh, Brendan, one last question. Yes, thank you. Caleb Dalton with Alliance Defending Freedom, Center for Academic Freedom. Thank you so much. Um, as you could tell by the word freedom, I, I love a lot the ideas of freedom. Um, but I, I do have a question as you implement this. Have, have you considered or are there already measures in place that would protect uh, for example, religious schools or religious nonprofits' ability to have access to these funds? Great question. And in fact, yes, the draft uh, language does include a specific protection um, against religious discrimination. And as it's been said, uh, religious discrimination is not a good policy. So um, making that assumption, we have also been very explicit to say it is not an option if uh, states el elect to be a part of this program. Terrific. Madam Secretary, Counselor, thank you so much for your time today. I <laughs> I'm going to ask the audience to remain seated uh, for a moment while we ch transition to the next panel. Thank you so much.
John. Well, good morning. Uh, my name is Nat Malkus. I'm an education policy scholar here at AEI. And I get to take us through round two, our panel with uh, state decision makers. And uh, we have an excellent panel. And I'm going to sort of introduce them now. And then we're going to jump right into uh, a discussion of uh, school choice in the states and what uh, education freedom scholarships uh, might mean there. Um, so I have uh, three state policymakers uh, here today. Kimberly Yi is the 36th treasurer of Arizona. Um, and we're glad to have you here. She stewards uh, a $40 billion state budget and makes sure that uh, the checks go to uh, whom they need to go to. Uh, Treasury Yee has a number of firsts under her belt that are worth mentioning. She's the first Asian American elected to statewide office in Arizona. Um, she's the first Chinese American Republican woman to win a major statewide office in the United States. Um, she was Senate Majority Leader in Arizona, and not the first, but uh, notably followed Sandra Day O'Connor uh, about four decades later, so that's worth mentioning. Um, she also, uh, as I said, she chaired the Senate Education Committee and helped create the nation's first education savings account in 2011. Um, and interestingly, has a little bit of a pattern, uh, I, I think, that you worked on the uh, executive team of uh, the former Arizona State Treasurer, Dean Martin, and now you hold that post. And you were an analyst for the Arizona Senate Committee on Education, which you would later chair. That's so right. <laughs> uh, some grassroots work and then uh, heading. Thanks for uh, being here. Uh, John DeBerry is uh, a representative of the 90th District in Tennessee General Assembly. Uh, he represents Memphis, and he's been there a while. Um, let's put it this way. He started in 1995 when I lived in Tennessee. So that's been quite a while since I've been in D.C. In the Assembly, he's been a member of several committees, including the Education Committee and the Curriculum Testing and Innovation Subcommittee. And he also serves as the Democratic leader pro tempore. Uh, Mike Torzai is our last leader. He's the Speaker of the Pennsylvania House of Representatives and represents the 28th District uh, in Allegheny County. Um, Speaker Torzai has been a member of the House since 2001 and was elected Speaker in 2015. And he's uh, also done um, groundbreaking work in Pennsylvania on their school choice initiatives. He led efforts uh, with Pennsylvania business leaders to implement a $50 million opportunity scholarship tax credit, which targets uh, children in low performing uh, schools. And uh, while he was House Majority Leader, he doubled the size of the uh, education Improvement Tax Credit, the other EITC, yes. uh, in Pennsylvania from 50 to $100 million. Now, but before we jump into questions, I'll just lay out some of the differences in the school choice landscape in the states. Uh, Tennessee has um, been fighting in recent uh, years to get programs up, and they did uh, just pass uh, another one for um, Memphis and uh, Nashville specifically. Um, uh, in, in Pennsylvania, there are two tax credit scholarships uh, that I mentioned already. They have 50,000 students uh, plus participating in them. Um, Arizona is sort of the heavy hitter with four different tax credit scholarships programs, uh, tens of thousands of students. And like I said, the first uh, ESA, uh, which is one of the most mature, they also uh, have a, a, a very uh, rare um, program of universal eligibility for their tax credit scholarship in, um, in Arizona. So a wide variety of states and contexts. Um, Speaker Torzai, if I could start with you um, reflecting on the conversation that we heard in the past hour. Um, I wonder what your take is, given that the states have been doing the heavy lifting on school choice for about three decades, right? Um, they've made all the progress that we've seen. And this is an opportunity with the Education Freedom Scholarships for the federal government to come in. And we heard discussions about some folks being a little wary of that. How does that play out down the line when there may be less school choice friendly folks um, in, the, uh, in the White House or in the administration? My question to you is, as a state leader that's been doing this work, <coughs> is this a good thing or a bad thing for school choice in the states? And why or why not? Nat, it's a decidedly good thing. And first and foremost, um, the proposal, the Education Freedom Scholarships that the Secretary and her team have put together is a mirror to a certain extent on, on 
work that has been done in Pennsylvania, Florida, and Arizona. And uh, so the laboratories of democracy have already shown that it works. In uh, Pennsylvania, we have a robust education improvement tax credit scholarship. It's up to $135 million uh, this past year. And uh, on top of that, we have the $55 million opportunity scholarship. Um, so a total of about $190 million. We've increased the limits uh, for income for families to make use of them. 50,000 students um, were able to receive some scholarship. Another, just shy of another 50,000 didn't get them. Another 145 million was left uh, off the table from businesses that wanted to get the tax credits. Um, it, it will work, it will work in all 50 states and it will work uh, with the partnership with the federal government. And here's the key. I, I thought the secretary made so many important points, but here's the key in what I, believe, and I hope I have this number right, in a $4.5 trillion budget in the federal level, um, $5 billion, I know we throw around the term billion, but $5 billion in tax credits, tax credits, people are still paying their tax liability. They're just directing it to <laughs> opportunities for kids to make a decision to go to a different school that fits them that many more affluent folks have. That's the fundamental issue. My wife and I, Lydia's a pediatrician. We have three boys, two, uh, one who graduated public high school, one who graduated from a struggling Catholic school, but that's where he wanted to go and it was a good fit. And our youngest who's in 11th grade is in the public school. But we could afford it. Many other folks do not have that opportunity and there are parents and grandparents and guardians all across the United States of America that want to have that fundamental opportunity to send their child that they are responsible for to the best place for that child. And the secretary and the team are taking that school choice movement and saying we ought to make it national and work with the states. I think it is a great opportunity. Uh, Representative DeBerry, you've been in the fight for school choice programs in Tennessee, um, and you have some fresh scars to show for it, I, I imagine. Um, Tennessee has two programs, but a long way to go to sort of catch up with either Pennsylvania or Arizona's progress. My question to you is, um, with the uh, political realities on the ground in Tennessee, um, how do you think the state might react and use the Education Freedom uh, Scholarship opportunity uh, were it to become law? Well, I, I think the misnomer is that the parents don't want it. They really do. And that it's not going to benefit the children. It really will. What's, what's happening in the state of Tennessee is what's happening all over the country. And those individuals who have a personal stake in the funds uh, that we allocate to educate our children are, are not necessarily concerned many times about what happens to the children. We have in the state of Tennessee what I call, and especially in Memphis, a large urban area, um, and the demographics speak for themselves, where the schoolhouse to jailhouse pipeline is, is wide open, and we're putting less and less children are in higher education or in positioning them so they can make a living. So what I think we have in the state of Tennessee is what we have across the country. We've got to deal with the perception that you know the 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 calling cry is public money into private schools and so on and so forth not necessarily taking to heart that it's public money to take care of our children and i think as the secretary said we've got to get the money uh, uh, uh concentrate on the children not the system and that's what we're doing i was accused of when we were talking about this in this debate it was said well, what's going to happen in the state of Tennessee is they're going to cherry pick. You're going to get the, the best children in this school and the best children in that school, in which my response was uh, education within itself uh, is, <coughs> in many places, is cherry. All kids don't go to law school. All kids don't go to medical school. All kids don't become architects or even teachers. In essence, those individuals who are prepared for those various professions and for those various disciplines, those are the ones that go there. What we've got to do is put more cherries on the tree. And that's what we're not doing. We've got to get more children ready to be picked, 
to, to go to school, to have those opportunities. And I think that's where the battle lies uh, in the state of Tennessee. We've got to uh, create and enhance and fortify the perception that this is a matter of national defense, if you please, and most certainly um, uh, the strengthening of our state. Treasury Yee, uh, in Arizona, you've got a very different uh, political realities on the ground, especially compared to Tennessee, and you have a much more robust system of, uh, of school choice, and uh, like I said earlier, you have four tax credit scholarship programs. Uh, my question is, if the EFS were to become a reality, what do you think Arizona would do with this uh, you know, new tailwind? And it seems to me that you could, uh, you know, you could build your programs up by increasing the amounts that are offered to kids, uh, or you could build them out by um, increasing the breadth of programs and more participation, or you could sort of build the options that they might include, and so maybe focus on concurrent enrollment or uh, pre-K and so forth. If Arizona had this tailwind, what do you think they would do with it? Well, let me first uh, just say that the uh, education financial scholarships have worked in our state, and we have been a robust school choice state. Um, we're celebrating 25 years of charter schools in Arizona. And for this federal proposal, um, it is not only good education policy, it's good tax policy. And for us to continue to enhance that in Arizona with this opportunity, we would be able to do more with what we already have put forward as a foundation. One of the things that um, the experiences I had in the state legislature before I became the state treasurer was always designing what works for the monies that were available, right, and the opportunities there. So we wouldn't have as many boundaries with this because we would have that much more to use uh, and, and be able to have more kids in those uh, schools that they want to be in. Right now, there are some um, prohibitions for the types of kids that can have and what we call an empowerment scholarship. And one of those is that if you're a preschooler, you have to be a preschooler with a disability. If you're a kindergartner, you have to be a kindergartner with a disability. Let's remove that and just let all of those preschoolers and all of those kindergartners be able to choose the school of their choice. And so again, this would allow us to enhance our existing programs in Arizona. Yeah, I'm, I'm interested in um, the, the form of the tax credit scholarship. So there's tax credit scholarships and we have uh, more traditional voucher programs. And then there's also education savings accounts. Um, and I'll just ask any of the three of you, EFS sort of comes as a tax credit scholarship. It uh, requires the state, if they haven't set up one, to identify the, the 501c3s or the, the scholarship granting organizations, the SGOs. Um, do you think that that format may sort of privilege the tax credit scholarship, uh, maybe to the, I don't know if they, they deserve an advantage, but to you know, the less likelihood that ESAs or vouchers would continue? And do you view that as a, a problem or an issue? Well, I can speak for Arizona. I think when uh, the secretary earlier shared that the way to sell this piece is to hear the testimonials of the very families who have um, been benefited from um, not only our ESAs, but also other school choice opportunities we have in Arizona. That tells the story. So what would this do? This would allow us to build that bridge to those who might not already um, you know, have this opportunity. Um, we could enhance the existing programs, and we could bring forward um, a, a new marketing tool, quite frankly, because um, if they have the experience um, with these wonderful opportunities of school choice. Let's share that story. Let's allow the other families that might have heard a story or two that may have been incorrect about the, you know, the um, opportunities these families had, let them hear about the families who have benefited, who have succeeded, and who are staying in the schools of their choice. Speaker Torres, I, I wanted to follow up and, and, and just give you the opportunity to answer the same question I asked earlier of uh, Treasury, Treasury Yee. You have a couple of um, tax credit scholarships. Um, what do you think Pennsylvania would be able to do with EFS? I mean, five years after the EFS would, had passed, would your tax credit scholarships be uh, you know, built up in value? Would they be, be expanded? Would they be for more options? Where would you uh, think the push would be in Pennsylvania? 
Without a doubt, they would enhance our existing educational improvement tax credit scholarships and our opportunity scholarship tax credits, without a doubt, because you could partner them up and, and you would actually be able to do two things. You would be able to expand the pool of um, families that get those scholarships and the amounts that they get. So um, you, I, I, I actually believe that you would continue to create waiting lists because it would become more and more attractive. Um, it, you never quite catch up, right? Because I think people want that choice. People of all backgrounds, all um, you know, rural, city, suburban, want opportunities to do what's best for their child. And I think the other thing that you asked is, is it going to crowd out other, um, other stratagems sure. for school other mechanisms. Yeah, other mechanisms for school choice. We have a proposal that we're putting out um, as a, as a pilot program or a prototype um, for the city of Harrisburg. That's our capital city. About 6,500 students in that, that particular school district. 7% of the students are testing proficient in algebra. 9% are testing pro proficient in biology. 13% are testing proficient in English. That's unacceptable. The secretary was gracious enough to come to the capital city and we went and saw um, Harrisburg uh, Elementary, Catholic Elementary School, K, uh, K through eight. And uh, those students were across the board, minority students, um, low income students, many single parent families uh, or the grandparents, you know, were, were doing much of the, uh, you, know, the edu you know, the rearing or the education. They were wearing uniforms. Uh, there was great discipline, great love, um, great learning environment. And those, we heard of a particular single mom with two boys in eighth grade and seventh grade who said it was the single most important decision in her life and that without the scholarship, which was about maybe one, one third of the amount, so she had to come up with the other amount for that tuition because it's not cheap, um, you know, to have even that, that, that school, she said it was the single most important decision and that she had her kids on the path where they were going to be able to succeed in life. You can see it. You can see it tangibly. So I, uh, if I'm a policymaker, keep moving forward. Whatever your strategy is, whatever your mechanism is, keep moving forward because, as, as this good representative said, there are a lot of people who want that choice. Representative DeBerry, I'm, I'm interested in... Um in states that aren't as far along, don't have developed programs, uh, some states don't have any school choice programs and their, their politics don't make them very likely to bring them on. Um, how much do you think that um, if the EFS program uh, came forward into law, as we're looking at, how, how much of a help would it be in states that currently offer no school choice proposals? I, I think, first of all, we've got to change the perception. The debate has gone on forever. I've been in office for 25 years. We've been talking about this forever. We go on and on and on in the conversation. The conversation gets convoluted, and the public gets confused at the, as to what we're really trying to do, and that's what's happening all over this country. I'm, I'm an old guy. My, my dad marched with Dr. King. I was somewhere back in the crowd as a teenage boy. When my dad integrated the schools in Crockett County in 1968 as the president of the NAACP, it was about school choice. It wasn't that the school that we were going to was insufficient. The teachers were wonderful. It was a great school, but we, it was a segregated society. That was the school we were sent to. Whether we liked it or not, because of all the various reasons, that's where we were supposed to be. My dad said, that's not right. We're changing this. We integrated the school in 1968, a great experience with the kids there at Crockett County High. This has gone on throughout my life. My children, my, my eldest daughter is an attorney. My youngest daughter is a therapist. Neither one of them would be who they are had I not had the ability to take them out of, a, of schools which were insufficient to educating them and preparing them for life. I got two jobs and I sent them to school and I paid the tuition because it's my responsibility to educate my children. When parents began to realize it's, these are their tax dollars, these are their children, these are their schools that they pay for, these are opportunities that are funded by the money that they work hard and give so that the government can properly use it. And when you have something called a failing school and we throw that term around like it's normal, 
That's not normal. And what, when, as soon as people get enough of it and, and decide that they want their children to have better, it's going to change across the state. So this is, this is an evolution of school choice as far as my experience is concerned, going all the way back to the 60s. It's still going on. And until parents have the right to say where their children are going to go so that they can have the opportunities that they need, then we'll, we'll keep talking about this. Hopefully, we'll get the perception changed so folks will understand this is not about unions. This is not about professions. This is about the children. And from the children, we work back to who it takes to make it happen. So I want to take a, a minute and, and zoom in a little bit on the, on the weeds. Uh, that's where I'm most comfortable. So, uh, you know, we talk about, well, we have these education freedom scholarships, we have tax credit scholarships, and then we, we give scholarships to kids. But there's a big institution in the, on the in-between there, and that's these scholarship granting organizations. Um, part of the strategy behind this bill is that by allowing states to determine um, who those scholarship granting organizations are and what they can do, that they have control over these uh, programs in, 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 large, uh, in a larger uh, aspect with some guardrails. Um, my question, especially in Pennsylvania and Arizona, um, what guides your choices of scholarship granting organizations? How does the state decide who should get them and why? Because they seem to play a pretty central role in these programs. In Arizona, we call them school tuition organizations, and they're 501c3s. So uh, because they are a 501c3, the state gets out of the way once they are granted as an organization. And then their, um, their role is to ensure that there is accountability on the side of the financials. And if you were to go to the ESAs, which are our empowerment scholarships, um, the state treasurer's office is the financial manager of those accounts, while the state department of education um, is the program manager of those accounts. Between the two state agencies, agencies, we ensure that uh, those dollars are being used for the very purposes so that the accountability is there, so that the taxpayers know that they're uh, being used for the purpose that was intended. At the same time, it allows for uh, the program to continue to grow because they see that there is um, a, a real strong program there with rails to guard against fraud. And one of the things that I found um, early on in uh, looking at our STOs is that families find the right STO uh, to go to. And and that is their choice, continuing down locally even to the family. So in Arizona, we have a number of STOs, and these school tuition organizations are around every single corner of the state. So if one resident wants to go to the northern part of Arizona and go to that STO, they can do that. It really doesn't matter because they all play a very important role in making sure the funds are available, uh, like a backpack, to go on the backs of that student wherever they choose to go to school. You know, um, these... Uh, scholarship organizations, the, the key thing is, is that um, when they apply to make use of the tax credits uh, and to give out the scholarships is that the money is in fact going to, um, is going to uh, schools that are providing a scholarship to those uh, students to be able to attend there. So the, the function of the scholarship organization is very defined, very defined. And the key thing is, is that uh, that you're looking over that that they are in fact sending the money to the school for that student to get that scholarship and and it's um it's actually e easy to audit and easy to if you if you and we have a, a department that that does it under the department of education that watches that and uh, you have to be approved in the first place and then secondly you, you you get watched and you have to send send in reports but that's the key and keep in mind, I just want to give this some context here. In the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, we spend over $30 billion of state and local tax dollars, all approved by the state, either on, on a statewide level or we give powers to school districts to you know, have taxes and raise money for public schools. Over $30 billion for public education K through 12. We're, we're in the top, let me just give you these, we're, we're in the top, we're the third in adjusted average teacher salary for public schools, third in adjusted average starting salary for public schools out of 50 states, third in adjusted average teacher salary to median household income, third in adjusted per student public school spending in Pennsylvania, 
The amount of scholarships we have is $190 million in tax credits. We are less than 1% of what we are spending on public education at over $30 billion. If we're gonna talk about accountability, I'd, I'd like to take maybe even a closer look at the $30 billion we're, we're, we're spending on public education K through 12 than this 190 million that we're allowing for tax credits. And, and these people that are trying to get the tax credits and give out the scholarships, they're people with a mission. What's the mission? Allow families, lower and middle income families, to be able to go to choices in education. Uh, a lot of those folks any day. They're, they're doing the right thing. So uh, I'm curious about um, the relationship between state, um, lawmakers, and policymakers, and the representatives that you send to Capitol Hill, and how you might be able to put pressure on them or get them to voice the concerns of the folks that you represent, uh, particularly on this issue. And I'd also just be curious generally about uh, the political climate in your state versus the political climate they're going to and what all those uh, forces mean for the likelihood of uh, the Education Freedom Scholarships uh, getting traction on Capitol Hill. Well, I think one of the aspects of this proposal is that um, it respects federalism and it allows for the states to design the program as they wish. And if you look back in Arizona in 1997 when we created charter schools and open enrollment um, and the school uh, tax credit, the tax credit individually as well as corporate, we gave a little piece to both parties, quite frankly. And um, so it, it allowed us to reach across the aisle, um, though the proposal was being advanced by the Republicans, our Democrat <laughs> friends were alongside the proposal because we allowed for the public schools to use a little bit of this as well to advance their tax credits um, for public schools. For instance, they could use it for fees or band or uniforms or you know other extracurricular related right. um, advancements. And so this could be designed in a way where it works for both parties and in a way where our public school advocates and our school choice advocates come together around the table to design what works best for that state. Um, I, I would just suggest, um, I know this is a, a fairly, uh, I'm, I'm not here in Washington, D.C., so I, I don't you know, know the lay of the land as, as those folks who are here. But I, but I would begin with the Senate Majority Leader. Um, and I, I would ask uh, Senator McConnell, who I think is a thoughtful person and a, 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 a diligent uh, public elected official, I would make this a priority. I, I would say, let's get this through the Senate with uh, alacrity. Why? Because once it passes the chamber, and, and as, a, as a Speaker of the House, I, you know, I have experience with this, and, and former Majority Leader, once it passes a chamber, it changes the chessboard because it has a level of reality. A body in the United States Congress actually passed it, and it puts pressure on the other body. And that pressure needs to come on Speaker Pelosi because she's a lot of talk and she's not a lot of delivery. I bet her kids, I don't know this, but I'll bet her kids went to private schools. I'm sure her entire circle of friends' kids went to private schools. So, so she want to offer that opportunity for a lot of other parents and grandparents and guardians throughout the United States of America? Or is she just about protecting the establishment and special interests? I'll bet the latter, but let's make her make the choice. But that has to begin with the Senate passing the bill. I don't, I don't want to pretend to get into the middle of the toxic atmosphere that exists here in Washington. Mm -hmm. Uh, because all it does is increase the toxicity in, in the state of Tennessee. We don't have the infrastructure that either of these states have since we're just getting started and there are a lot of, uh, lot of uncharted territory that we have to go through in, in implementing uh, our policies of school choice. But I think that, you know, we make stuff more complicated than it actually is because when we start talking about accountability and measurable results, everybody in this room, business people, uh, uh, academians, or whatever we might be, that's the way we operate in, in the American system. 
uh, we are accountable for the funds that we receive, the funds that are allocated, the funds that uh, go to education in my uh, well over a billion dollars in, in my county. And, and it, what if we started becoming accountable and we looked at results that were measurable and that the money was doing what it was supposed to do? I think that until, until here again, as the secretary said, until we move the system, until we move all the bullies, till we move the people who have, who have self-interest, the folks who are locked in their silos and they are deeply rooted in their own opinion rather than what is best, uh, we, we get nowhere. At some point in time, if we're going to have a generation that's going to be compete, if we're going to get away from being number 40 in the world and the laughing stock of the world, when we've got all of these advantages and all of these blessings and we're not passing it on to our offspring, if, if that's going to happen, then we've got to be adults. Maturity is doing what's best, even if it's not what I want. And folks who get elected to office are going to have to stop acting like a bunch of children, sit down at the table and act like adults and solve this problem. I believe um, Councillor Conway said hope springs eternal. So we'll, uh, <laughs> I have a question on, uh, back on the tax credit scholarships. Um, I'm, studied school choice programs quite a bit. There's a, a lot of things to like about tax credit scholarships. Uh, one of the things generally across the programs to not like is that they're fairly lowly funded. Vouchers and certainly ESAs are uh, more highly funded. Um, I, I just wonder what, what to make of this, especially from Pennsylvania and Arizona to uh, uh, Representative DeBerry, who doesn't have a tax credit scholarship yet, um, what are some of the difficulties with getting these scholarship amounts up high enough to really help especially low-income yeah. folks? Um, Leader Terzai, you mentioned the, 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 the woman who was getting a scholarship for about a third of tuition. You know, if you're a low-income yeah. uh, family in Harrisburg coming up with four or $5,000 a year, is tough. Yes. Yeah. No, it's a, it's, it's a very good point. But you, you have to get the foot in the door, and it, it is saving lives. Because there's 50,000 students in Pennsylvania who wouldn't otherwise have this choice. And uh, would we like to see it expanded to, to more individuals? Yes. No, here's what we did. We had a bill, House Bill 800, passed both the House and the Senate, had bipartisan support in the House, uh, was uh, just Republicans in the Senate, went to the governor's desk. Wall Street Journal editorialized three times in favor of it asked the governor to sign it, and he vetoed it. What it would have done, it would have increased our, our uh, educational improvement tax credit scholarship by 100 million. It would be like a booster, um, you know, to take it from um, up to $210 million. We were at $110 million. We've subsequently got it up to $135 million. But to take it up to $210 million, and then we had an escalator, which we are borrowing from Florida. We didn't come up with the idea. Um, and uh, it would, it would have been a 10% increase uh, if there were enough subscriptions. There's always enough subscriptions and uh, for students and that, that, that want these scholarships. And, um, and then that would have increased every year by you know, 10%. So it was a multiplier, right? Uh, that was one, one of the reasons the governor vetoed it. We have to continue to, to keep moving forward. We are taking a, a different approach with this Harrisburg uh, uh, prototype. Um, we're doing a more direct scholarship. Um, it's going to be 50% of basic education funding split in part by the local school district and by the state. In Harrisburg's instance, it'll amount to about $8,200, 4100 and 4100 Keep in mind, however, for the local school district, we are not changing what, what you call their average daily membership count. In fact, we're going to be increasing it. Um, because we'll throw in the number of students already in private schools into that number when we allocate the state tax dollars. So on a per pupil basis, say 25% of the students decide to choose these scholarships, um, they would be educating for a higher dollar amount, 75% of the kids, um, which means that on a per pupil basis, that amount goes up. And right now, Harrisburg is spending 
uh, 22,000, when I say Harrisburg itself, it, it's both state and local tax dollars, 22,000 per student, I already gave you the results, that's well above the national average. And in addition, 60% of that amount is coming from state tax dollars, while 40% of it is coming from local tax dollars that, that we've empowered them to do. So I, I, I do think that, that there's a variety of approaches to take. I don't think you sit on any one approach to school choice. The treasurer talked about 25 years of charter schools in the state of Arizona. Charter schools are another approach. Um, but, but if you're saving lives, why wouldn't you continue to pursue it? Treasurer Yee, I'm interested in, in, in your comments just on the difficulty of getting these scholarship amounts. Uh, you know, hi. <laughs> well, the 90% of the um, basic state aid is what we use for ESAs, which are um, empowerment right. scholarships. So it really is saving the taxpayers funds that would otherwise go to a full 100% public school student. Um, that's one aspect. Uh, secondly, if you take a look at um, what parents are receiving, they this allows them to truly take a look at what the state is giving them um, and choosing no matter where they live, whatever zip code they live in, the school of their choice, the school that best fits their child's needs. That is a concept that we have to remember when we talk about freedom. And, and who is to say that for any nonprofit, because as we were talking about school tuition organizations are a 501c3. Who in America has a, a cap on how much you should be able to give to you know, your favorite nonprofit. And, and so we should be able to look at expanding that if we already have that in existence in our state um, and, and be able to have a, a taxpayer allocate more to that school tuition organization so that more kids can benefit from this great program. Um, one of the things that I um, try to do when I work through the legislative process in advocating for this is to really talk about how um, these stories really do sell the initiative. Um, and we have had 25 years of stories to tell in Arizona. And truly, some of these stories bring you to tears because of how families have escaped from a system that um, has just uh, pushed their child back, sometimes grade levels back. And now they have the freedom to choose the school of their choice. For instance, we have a, a number of um, communities where um, if the, the school, uh, their you know, zip code um, is a failing school, they've had to be trapped in that school for all of these years. Suddenly, with our um, empowerment scholarships and with our school choice options in Arizona, they're able to go to another school that works best for them, that where they can succeed. Those are the stories that will sell this initiative, not only in the states, but also on that hill. And I think that that really is something that Arizona is committed to do, to be able to share the you know decades of experience that we've had on school choice. So. Different school choice, uh, private school choice options often have different targeting. Some of the programs, uh, Arizona has a tax credit scholarship that's universal. That is rare. Uh, most of them are targeted either to low income students, they're targeted to students with disabilities, uh, some targeted to students that are bullied, uh, some targeted to low performing schools or, or, or districts in a state. Um, as, as state leaders dealing with these issues, how do you think about the trade-offs in those different eligibility rules? And for a state that's sort of considering to take a first foray into these things, where would you suggest um, is the sweet spot in terms of uh, program eligibility? Well, one of the myths is that if we open up the caps or if we open up uh, the number of students uh, and remove the prohibitions that we have, uh, that all of the kids from the public schools are going to run into the private school um, uh, landscape. It's, that's not the case. We've had ESAs in Arizona on the books since 2011. And you can see that there has been movement uh, where parents are able to walk to the schools of their choice with their children. But it's not this exodus from the public school system. So that really does speak to the fact that it's about freedom. You can choose to use it or you can choose not to use it. But Allowing states to have that ability to design the program of their choice goes back to the, you know, the, the respect that the states should have in designing the program that fits best for this new program. And for Arizona, again, we have a longstanding history with school choice. We feel this would just enhance those programs and allow us to, to have more students benefit from school choice. 
Representative Gunn. If, if the <clears throat> public schools looked at poor children as, and, and gave them the opportunities that they absolutely have to have if they're going to escape poverty and the cycle of poverty, then we wouldn't be constantly using those children as, as our imaginary target for every program that we come up with. Well, we're going to help poor children with this. Well, we're going to help poor children with this. We, we've got to get off of this bandwagon and, and simply say, we've got to do what's best for all students, regardless of who they are. Now, the reason we start with, with poor children in the state of Tennessee, children who, whose families qualify for temporary federal assistance, is because those children have been woefully neglected. Those children are the ones who fill up the prisons. They're the ones who fill up the gangs. They're the ones who have not been given the attention that they need uh, uh, remediated so that they can learn to read better. I have given kids a dollar for every report card cycle since first grade, and watch them go through 12 years of school, have their diploma in hand with honors, and they can't make a 14 or 15 on the ACT. And then we want to say it's that child's fault when that child has sat in our system, under our tutelage, under our care for 12 years, and we have failed to get them ready. So number one, we got to stop using the poor children uh, so that we can appease our conscience or so we can ease a program through or whatever and simply do what's right and say that we in America are failing our children. We are not competing with the rest of the world. We have a global economy. A child uh, anywhere in the world can get on an airplane and be in America within a matter of hours and sit right beside a child who has been here all of their lives applying for the same exact job with better skills. And until we start looking at this as a matter of the preservation of our republic, of our national defense, and taking care of our citizens, we're going to just keep spinning our wheels. And that's kind of where we are right now. Well, Speaker Terza, I want to get to you on this question of targeting. But first, I want to just ask about T Tennessee's recent experience, because you have a very sort of odd set of targets in this latest bill, and that's Memphis and Nashville exactly. instead of the state. So I'm just a little curious how that unfolded and why. It unfolded because there are those who absolutely um, believe that because this is public money, even though we have scholarships, um, Tennessee Promise, that takes public money, and a child can take that money to any school, private or public, that they wish, to get a good education, and this has worked uh, wonderfully throughout the state of Tennessee, uh, educating so many young people. We want to do the same thing as far as high school is concerned or uh, elementary is, is concerned, and there are those who say that this is absolutely uh, not right. Uh, it is against the public interest. As a matter of fact, there's a bill filed already to repeal and to undo what we did last year. So it's, it's that um, um, uh, attitude and perception that this is ours to control. Uh, in, in my opinion, you have many, many wonderful teachers, many wonderful schools, people who are giving their absolute best, taking money out of their pocket. But it, when you have a systemic problem like we have, where there are organizations that their very existence depends upon controlling those funds, they're going to fight for dear life to control them. And that's what's happening in Tennessee. And I venture that's what's happening all over the country. So I, I'm just interested to follow up on this one more because it, it seems at, at first it was a uh, Tennessee-wide program. Right. And then it was scaled down to right. uh, these two counties, Memphis and Nashville Metro, uh, essentially. And there's an implicit logic there in the votes that, well, it's okay for these two urban centers as long as we pull the rest of the the state off the eligibility map. And I'm trying to f understand where that logic makes the bill easier to pass. Well, it makes it easier to pass if you've got folks say, not in my backyard and not in my school system. And those that have, and there are some wonderful school systems in the state of Tennessee, all over the state of Tennessee. But that's, all of us put our money in the pot all over the state of Tennessee to take care of the state's best interest. That's all of the state, uh, from Memphis to Mountain City. And until 
uh, we in the state of Tennessee, here again, and all over the country, until we start looking at this holistically. If one child fails, we all fail. And, uh, and until that happens, then we're going to continue to say, not in my backyard, and it gets whittled down and whittled down and whittled down into its two major areas. And here again, the insulting part of that is it, it, it's always with certain demographics. You know, poor people, uh, uh, black people, Hispanic people, folks who have various issues in life didn't just drop down from Mars. They've been here all along. So we've got to c continue to look uh, at our own deficiencies as legislators and those who govern to realize that the problems that exist were not created by the people. They were created by us. The public education, we created it. We've got to recreate it. And that's where our mind has got to be. Speaker Turner, I want to give you a chance on the, um, on the targeting question, but first I want to just tell the audience that uh, in, in just a couple of minutes here we'll take questions, so um, prepare for those. Um, as far as, as, as targeting eligibility, um, how's that been in Pennsylvania, and what might you advise other states? You know, it's a, it's a great question for public policymakers, but uh, I, I myself think it should be as expansive and as broad as it can be, ideally. Um, our educational improvement tax credit scholarship, um, we, we focused on increasing that because it's, it's available across the state in rural, suburban, and urban areas, all, all, all areas. And guess what? There's a, a desire um, or a want in communities all across the state. Um, I've seen it in, in uh, Orthodox Jewish schools in, in the city of Philadelphia and in the city of Pittsburgh. Uh, but I've seen it in um, more rural uh, Catholic and Christian schools, and I've seen it in, in, in suburban schools that are, you know, just private non-denominational schools. There are um, administrators and, and educators in each of those types of schools that um, make use of and benefit for, for the families and the kids uh, educational improvement tax credit scholarships. Uh, the one restraint that we have, but that we have twice now increased, is income limits. Because I, I think that who might take advantage of these um, are, are also middle-income families and, and low-income families, too. Um, two working parents sometimes would love to make use, uh, you know, would love to send their, their child uh, to uh, a local Catholic, Christian, Jewish, non-denominational school. They would like to do that. But at 12000 which is not, you know, that's a, a, a typically priced high school. Many others go much higher. You know, the EITC is, is what they need to get over the goal line. And, uh, and, and it should be available to as many people as possible. If I could, I would increase the income limits even higher. Um, I, I can't do it singularly yet. You need to, to uh, legislative bodies and a governor on board, but I think that's crucial, but we have increased our limits. I do think, however, that on this, what we're doing with a, a more robust direct scholarship in Harrisburg is modeled similarly on what has happened in Cleveland and in Milwaukee, and I think what the good representative and his uh, folks are doing down in Tennessee with respect to Nashville and Memphis. Um, at a certain point, I use this phrase already, but I'm going to repeat it. You need to get a foot in the door, and you need to save lives, and you want to do it any way that you can. Also, I just want to reemphasize this point that the treasurer made. Look, we, Pennsylvania is a state that spends a considerable amount of tax dollars on public education. For a lot of students, they get a great education in the public schools. If that's what fits those particular students, that's great. But we know from fact, from stories, from encountering families, it, it's, it, it's not one size fits all. And, and that choice should be available. And that's what the United States Secretary of Education and her team are proposing. Let's, let's go from what's happened in the states and take it across the United States. All right, I'd like to turn it uh, open to questions from the audience, uh, if, we, if we can. Again, we have sort of two rules here at AEI. When you um, have a question, um, just give us your name and affiliation, and then ask a question. Um, RJ, right here. 
Good morning, my name is Mary Lou and I am a science teacher, 33 years in the public school system in New York. I don't hear the voice of the teacher in any of these discussions. And I feel that they are a large stakeholder. How can I return to my colleagues and assure them that this educational freedom scholarship will not harm education as we know it, will not cause them their jobs, will not somehow adversely impact them. If we could get teachers on the side of the scholarships, I think they could influence their leaders um, in this direction. If I Go ahead. To that. Um, and first of all, I'm a, the daughter of a public school teacher who taught for 38 years in, a, in one of the poorest school districts in the state of Arizona. Uh, so I, I bring a great respect um, and admiration to our public school system when we talk about these types of school debates and school reform. And um, I have been one to always bring uh, those around the table, whether they agree with each other or not, because the voices are very important to the end result of the design of what we will pursue. And in this, it makes the case that um, we will have more opportunities because the funding is coming alongside the, from the federal government. And it's interesting because having been in public policy um, prior to elective office for 23 years, I have never seen uh, federal Department of Education come alongside to partner with the states and say, we're going to take a hands-off approach on this <laughs> initiative and give the states the ability to design uh, education, freedom, scholarship, how it works for your state. And it's going to look different from every state in the country. That's great. What a wonderful opportunity. And for the public school advocates in my state, I would say to them that this allows us to uh, counter the debate that our general fund will have money scooped away from the public school system. That will not be the case if we have a supplemental amount of funding coming from the federal government for the first time that I can remember on a school choice design program. So this is an exciting opportunity that we should be embracing. And I would say that this is a, a wonderful opportunity to bring the education advocates from the public school system to the table because there's nothing that says they can't be a part of this design. In Arizona, as I shared earlier, Earlier, we uh, provided a tax credit for public schools at the same time that we advanced our school tuition organizations and allowed for tax credits for um, individuals and corporations to move forward funding for individuals to go to a private school. So everybody got a little bit of something. Representative DeBerry, I want to get you in quickly. Um, just this morning, I hope the Secretary doesn't mind me mentioning it, but we had a conversation about that very thing. And that is letting the teachers know that they're part of this, they're stakeholders in this, and that it can't be done without them. Uh, when we were discussing this in the state of Tennessee, we had kind of a uh, saying that is sort of like, you know, you say, if mama's not happy, nobody's happy. <laughs> well, if the teachers are not happy, nobody's happy. And I think that all of us have got to take uh, that to heart and make sure that the teachers know that if this is going to succeed or anything we're doing in education is going to succeed, the teachers are an integral part of it. Another, another one, question? My, one, one last. Oh. I, I think this point just has to get made. Look, I'm, I'm a son of a public school teacher, too. My dad was a long-time public school teacher. My brother's a public school teacher. But it, it is true that this discussion is about the, the child. That is where the discussion is. And it's about the parents or the grandparents and the guardian. Look, in Philadelphia, there's 200,000 students. Um, about 70,000 are in charter schools. About 30,000 more want to be in charter schools. They have a lottery. My colleague said that the, one of the most frequently asked questions she gets um, from her constituents in Philadelphia is, is, hey, can you help me like, get into one of these charter schools? I didn't create that waiting list of 30,000 families. Um, the 70,000 families that already are in there, I, I didn't create that. People are making a decision, family by family, that, that they want that opportunity. And they see something. Maybe it's the uniforms. Maybe it's some discipline. It's not always additional uh, laboratories, by the way. Sometimes it is. Sometimes it isn't. 
people want to give their kids a break that they might not have had in their lives. That's, that's what's driving this. That does not mean that the public school system is going to disappear. I actually think many public schools will even get better based on the competition. And I think teachers rise to that level of competition because the teachers I know, that's what they do. The good teachers, that's what they do. Thanks. That was a great question. Brennan? Hi, I'm Olivia O'Sullivan, and I'm a freshman at NYU, as well as um, a research associate at the Federalist Society. And I really appreciate um, the panel and all of your conversation about autonomy and freedom within education. But I do want to push back on sort of an assumption I, um, I observed that all parents necessarily have their children's best interests at heart. And how do you ensure that parents who don't necessarily know their, uh, their children's best interest, or for children who don't have parents who are in the, um, in the foster system perhaps, how do you um, make sure that no children get, uh, get left behind and that all children are be, being advocated for? Yeah, the key there is, is you wanna save every life that you can possibly save. That's first and foremost. So you gotta keep that in mind. And you're right, not every child has that person who's responsible in their life, but many do. Because built into your statement is an assumption that because somebody might be of lower economic value, that they don't have the same care and concern for that child that people of a higher economic value do. And I think that is innately discriminatory. In addition, I will tell you this. I've been with a lot of those parents who are waiting in line, or grandparents, or aunts or uncles or guardians who want to get that kid into a charter school. I've been there on that lottery day. And let me tell you, those people, in fact, care very deeply. Just recently on the EITC front, I was at a Catholic um, fair for their school, trying to raise some money. A grandma came up to me and told me, you know, my daughter is a drug addict. I've taken charge of this young boy. I'm 70, and I'm so worried about what's going to happen to him. But I'm hoping that this EITC scholarship is around because I know he's going to get an opportunity that he would not have otherwise had. Yeah, um, when I listen to the young, young lady's question, I, I hear something else in there also. And, and, and the, the bitter pill that none of us seem to want to swallow today in this society is the fact that the breakdown of the family and the fact that there are a lot of children who have no one or at least don't have the type of family that many of us have. Uh, and, and these are the children that are, are in many places suffering. Uh, and these are also the children that in many places the state uh, has them as wards and taking care of them and feeding them and educating them and everything else. I think that we've got to put that on the table. When we have this discussion, we've got to talk about the breakdown of the family, the fact that many children don't have parents who have their best interests at heart. And when, as we, we uh, broker these uh, various programs and policies, that has got to be on the table. It must be part of the discussion, and it must be solved. I'm afraid that we are out of time, so we'll have to let uh, Representative DeBerry stand on that. I'd like to thank uh, Speaker Terzai, Representative DeBerry, and Treasurer Yi for talking to us today, and uh, thank you for coming. Thank you for having us. Hey, You're good, Great brother. See you. You're good. You are too. Yeah. <laughs> oh, what a pleasure.